Right. So we were talking about fading channels, uh, wireless fading channels. Uh, in particular, single user or, or one transmitter, one receiver uh, fading channels. Uh, we saw that, broadly speaking, we can categorize uh, a point-to-point -point fading channel into two types, a fast fading channel and a slow fading channel. So we say that a channel is fast fading if, if the channel gains, GIs, are, are distributed uh, IID according to some known distribution FG. Or it could also be the case that GI is, uh, or more generally, this could be the process G1 to Gn is stationary and ergodic. All right, and uh, so, so so that is uh, a fast fading channel, uh, and of course the ZI is Gauss Gaussian noise. Uh, in contrast to this, so so this happens when uh, the coherence time is is really small, so so the channel typically rapidly changes with time. But in contrast to this, we can have a slow fading channel where the coherence time is large. And, and channel gain remains constant for a long period of time. Uh, typically, we assume that, that GI is constant for the entire block of n channel users. Uh, right? and, and we saw a bunch of tools to deal with fading channels. Since, since the channel gains may be known at either the transmitter or the receiver or both, uh, this, this corresponds to a channel with state where, uh, uh, where the state may be known to one of the two parties. Okay, and, and we've already seen what the capacity of a channel with state is. And we, and we used those results to find the capacity of the fast fading channel with, with, with either channel state information available only at the receiver or channel state information available both at the transmitter and the receiver. Right? So when, when the channel gains, when, when it is a fast fading channel, a distributed IAD, and uh, and the channel gains are known only to the decoder, then we saw that the, that the capacity is equal to this particular quantity. So it is the expectation over G of half log of one plus G square P over sigma Z square, right? Uh, in fact, this turns out to be the case. So, so this is the capacity, even if it is a general, stationary and ergodic process. And that is Gn is stationary and, and ergodic. And, and sometimes in the wireless communication literature, this, this quantity is called the ergodic capacity. So if you go to if you go read some papers on wireless communications, then then when you're talking about wireless fading channels, sometimes they use the term ergodic capacity, and by that they mean this quantity, and this holds only for fast fading channels. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, if we have uh, channel state information at the transmitter, then you can do something better than this, and uh, and how you do this is that. Since the, since the transmitter knows how the channel is varying with time, uh, instead of using, const using the same amount of power for all channel uses, it can adaptively change the amount of power used uh, across each of the channel uses. So depending on what the channel gain is at the current time instant, you can control the amount of power that you're using. And, and in this case, since it's a generalization, since it's a, it's a scheme, which generalizes what we had in the previous approach, you can, you can achieve something better. And in this case, the capacity is given by this, the solution to this maximization problem. So it is a maximum over all possible power control schemes, such that the average power is less than or equal to P, 
of, of the same quantity, expectation of half log 1 plus g square phi of g divided by sigma square. So, so depending on what the channel gain g is, you, you decide to put an amount of power phi of g in that particular channel use. So for every i, the channel coefficient is g i, and the amount of power you will be using in that channel use is going to be phi of g i. Okay, and and you can you can try to solve this maximization problem using Lagrange multipliers. It's a convex optimization problem, and and it turns out that the optimal power control scheme is a is a water filling scheme. Uh, so now note that unlike the water filling scheme we've seen previously, where uh, you did water filling for parallel channels, uh, this water filling scheme is is actually across time. And, and also this, uh, this, this water filling scheme is, is not for a, a finite set of channels, but, but it's a continuous function, right? It's a function of G, uh, where G is a continuous variable. All right, and, and these are sort of standard techniques uh, which, are, which are used when you want to study capacities of wireless communication channels. Okay, so any questions uh, regarding this? All right, so, so these were fast fading channels, right? And in which case we can define what, what I call an ergodic capacity. The capacity is well defined because it is a memoryless channel. Now, on the other hand, if you have a slow fading channel where, uh, where the channel coefficient remains constant uh, across all the n channel uses, so in this case, y of i equal to g times x of i plus z of i, where g may, may not be known at the transmitter or, or the receiver. Uh, in this case, it, it turns out that uh, it's impossible to get a vanishingly small probability of error. So there is no notion of a capacity in this particular case, or the, or the standard notion of capacity if you try to think about the standard notion of capacity, then the capacity is equal to zero for for general uh, G. So for example, if you take G to be a Gaussian random variable, then the capacity, then the standard capacity turns out to be zero. And and why is that the case? So, so you fix any particular rate R, doesn't matter what it is, no matter how small it is, fix any R greater than zero. Okay, let's say that you decide this beforehand and, and try to design any code book, all right? Uh, so do you think it is possible to get a vanishingly small probability of error? In particular, the pro can the probability of error tend to zero as n tends to infinity? What can happen? We still have additive and Gaussian noise, no, sir? You have AWG, and that is true. Uh, but but that is fixed, right? So it's Gaussian with mean 0 and variance sigma square, where sigma square is fixed throughout time. Uh, but And G is also fixed for all the ch n channel uses. So so let's assume that G is a, is a Gaussian random variable. So I fix any rate. So, so the rate is, remember, is, is fixed beforehand, even before G is instantiated. What can go bad? Uh, then error may exist, like even even for after certain time also, error may exist. Correct. But, but what, what causes the error? So let's say I use a, a, a capacity achieving code for the AWG and channel. OK, I fix a rate. I use a, a, a use a coding scheme which achieves 
so so if i pass it through an if i use that to communicate over an awg and channel then the probability i know that the probability of error is vanishing in it but but in this case i claim that the probability of error is does not vanish with n the probability of error is always going to be a constant independent of n no matter which code i use right so you decide this beforehand right so even before you get the message even before you see what g is even before transmitting you decide you fix some rate uh, maybe it's 0.001 okay and uh, and and use the best possible code then i claim that the probability of error does not tend to zero as n tends to infinity it's maybe something small but but if if i increase n then the probability of error doesn't get any smaller uh, due to multiple paths or something like that no there's only a single path okay so so uh, suppose sir, that uh, yeah go ahead sir so or else like is it like this like uh, since rate is fixed i mean uh, huh? uh, do you mean to adjust to it uh, the gain may add any uh, additional noise or something like that because of which this p uh, this probability of error will be there you are close you are close to the correct answer uh so it's it's a little bit different from from what you said it is indeed because of the gain so suppose that i fix a rate what is the smallest gain for which i can have the probability of error to be vanishing with n so so when does the probability of error vanish with n what does shannon's channel coding theorem say half log 2 pi uh... like uh, no it's half log 1 plus g square p by sigma square right okay. so if the rate is less than half log 1 plus g square p over sigma square then you know that the probability of error tends to zero as n tends to infinity but now what if r is greater than this quantity what happens probability of error is not zero this will high yeah, it it's will greater than mm. yes. in, in, in yes. fact yes. the the strong converse says that the probability of error tends to one, one. as n tends to infinity yes all right but note that so i'm fixing an r so this r is fixed beforehand but the right hand side is a random quantity because g is random right so with a certain probability r is going to be uh, g is going to be satisfy this constraint yes. but with a certain non zero probability uh, yes. it is going to satisfy this particular constraint in, and in which case the probability of error will tend to one right yes. so so this so this so, so in some sense this is a good event whereas this is a bad event right if if it's a good event then then everything is good you can you can decode reliably no issues but but with some probability this event is going to occur and this is going to be a bad event and this is what we call in the in wireless communication terminology this is called an outage so it's occur only in slow fading channel case or 
it occurs only in the slow fading channel because because remember that g is going to be g is going to be fixed mm -hmm. uh, sorry g is going to remain constant mm -hmm. right yes so so with some probability g is going to be very low and if it is low it is going to be low for all of the n channels correct yes sir whereas on the other hand even though the fast fading channel some kind of looks bad uh, the good thing about a fast fading channel is that since it is rapidly varying you know that if i mean maybe at the current time instant you you have uh, a, a deep fade that is the channel coefficient is very very small but you know that very soon you are going to get the channel go, uh, coefficient is again going to go up because it's varying in an iid fashion right yes sir whereas on the other hand uh, so this 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 event is also sometimes called a deep fade uh, or an outage i mean so i'm being a little loose with the terminology uh, but but if the channel gain is very small then it's called a deep fade uh, if if it, if you're in a deep fade then you're going to remain in a deep fade of for all the n channel uses right but on the other hand for a fast fading channel you will not remain in deep fade for too long you are going to jump out of a deep fade and, and it's going to get better soon and that is the real advantage of a fast fading channel uh, for a slow fading channel if you are bad you are bad throughout if you are good then you are good throughout right and and in particular if you don't know what the channel gain is at the transmitter then the transmitter doesn't really know whether you are in a deep fade or not correct uh, only the receiver will know so the transmitter will decide to fix it will decide to transmit at a particular rate and if that rate is is below if, if that rate turns out to be larger than half log 1 plus g square p by sigma square then then you're done you can't do anything the whole block is gone All right uh, so that is the real issue with a slow fading channel in, in fact it turns out that even even if uh, you have even if both the transmitter and the receiver know the channel gain there is still no notion of ergodic capacity uh, because with a certain probability no matter what rate you choose uh, with, with a certain probability you will be in a deep fade and that probability of being in a deep fade is a constant so so for any fixed rate the probability of error can never be vanishing with it okay so that is why slow fading channels require a completely different approach uh, we use a similar metric as the, the standard rate and standard capacity but something a bit different okay and and there are different ways of approaching this this particular problem uh, and i'll just outline a couple of them so the first approach is uh, what what is what the textbook calls the compound channel approach so and, and this holds for certain kinds of channels alone so let us assume that uh, so you, so so note that g has follow some particular distribution uh, g is follow some particular distribution so if g is always going to be bounded away from zero so minimum over all possible g if g uh, suppose that g is always bonded from from a box so if the density is zero for for g greater than zero g greater than zero if this quantity is is large so maybe the the density function if you suppose that the density is zero for some interval uh, around zero so maybe the density looks something like this or or maybe it's 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 one sided that is also fine it doesn't matter what the density looks like as long as in the neighborhood of zero it is strictly zero right so if this happens then the capacity assuming that so you can view this as a compound channel 
and you can see that the capacity is is the minimum over all possible g of half log 1 plus g square p over sigma square. Okay, but, but in general, this is bad. So if you assume that g is Gaussian, then this compound channel approach gives you zero capacity. Right? Because the, the minimum overall possible G of this quantity is, is equal to zero. Right? So it's minimum of G such that F G of G is greater than zero of this. So, so that's not a good approach and is generally not followed anywhere. On the other hand, uh, what, what is more commonly followed in, in, in wireless communications is, is the following outage approach. So you know that the probability of error is, is going to is not going to be vanishing with n. Okay. And that's okay. You say that's fine. So with a certain probability, so if you fix a particular rate, you know that with a certain probability you're going to succeed, and with a certain probability you're going to fail. Okay. So so you fix a parameter p out which is called the outage probability. Okay, and this is sort of the probability of failure. So if an outage occurs, then you will not be able to decode reliably. But then if this does not occur, if the outage event does not occur, then the probability of error is going to be vanishing with n. Okay, this is going to be some constant uh, between zero and one. Okay, you fix this beforehand. It's, it's, it's part of the system design. And then uh, you say that the, the outage capacity, that's why I call this C tilde instead of C. Uh, so the outage capacity Uh, C tilde, this is obviously a function of the outage probability. So this is, you take the maximum over all possible G such that the probability that the mod G, sorry, is less than mod g. Uh, so this probability, the probability that the actual channel gain is less than this particular little g is less than or equal to the outage probability of half log 1 plus g square p over sigma square. Correct? So if if capital G is less than this particular quantity, if the true channel coefficient is less than small g, then an outage event occurs, uh, and and therefore you will not be able to decode correctly. Uh, sorry, if if the, yeah, and but but if the channel gain is larger than small g, then then you're good. Then 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 you're operating at then, then you're actually operating at a rate below the capacity, and therefore. Uh, you will be able to decode with, with vanishingly small probability of error. Okay, but this event that you will be able to decode correctly is, is something between zero and one. It is one minus P out. Okay, so, so this is not a true capacity, uh, but then it's still called the, the outage capacity or the outage rate. Uh, and, and this probability, the probability that you will actually succeed in decoding the message correctly is, is called the outage probability. Okay, so, so typically when you're talking about slow fading channels, you analyze the outage probability. Okay, 
any any questions so this is an important distinguishing factor between slow fading and in the approaches used for slow fading and fast fading channels uh, if in a fast fading channel you don't have this this outage happening uh, whereas in a slow fading channel you will be in outage with with a certain non zero probability okay so so this is the sort of the most commonly used approach for uh, slow fading channels uh, but then let's of course this is not really a separate approach but but let us assume that uh, this is not good enough for you okay so you know that there is going to be a certain channel gain so you decide to you, you decide to operate at a, at a certain rate and there is one channel gain below g let's let, or let me call this g star or or whatever this is the outage case so if if the actual channel gain is less than g star then you're going to fail uh, but then if it is greater than g star then you're going to succeed so below this you have outage all right uh, but but maybe this is not good enough so you want to make sure that even though the actual channel gain is something less than g star sometimes you want to get some information across right uh, even if uh, even if you're not able to get the full information uh, you want to be able to maybe get some you want to get be part of the message across so this is common uh, for example in video transmission right so let's assume that you have a user who is uh, was maybe looking at a video on youtube and is connected to the base station uh you want to make sure that okay if if the channel gain is good then you want him to be able to view a high resolution video uh, maybe 720p uh, but then maybe in case he is in case the channel in, in case the fading coefficient is is a little small then then you don't have to say that okay he gets absolutely nothing maybe he can view it at 480p if the channel gain is even smaller then view it at 280p sorry 240p right and that is what actually happens in practice uh, right so when you are watching a youtube video you will see that if you are if you are moving around a bit then sometimes you you have good signal reception you can watch the video at 720p uh but then if you move a bit maybe the the reception becomes a little poorer but that doesn't mean that you get no video at all right you're still able to view it at whatever 720p or at 480p uh, and or or at least at 240p correct so so but, but and how how exactly does that work uh, it uses the following broadcast channel approach okay, so th there are a lot more uh, bells and whistles involved but but broadly speaking you can use the following approach so you fix a couple of channel gains okay so and basically you say whatever you fix a g1 and g2 g3 uh you want to ensure that if uh so so g3 is less than g2 is less than g1 so if the actual channel gain is greater than g1 then you transmit at the highest possible rate you you transmit at half log 1 plus g1 p g1 square p over sigma square uh if the channel gain so so you want to ensure that this much of information goes to the receiver let me call this c1 tilde if it is if it is between g2 and g1 then 
you want to ensure that you, you get an amount of information equal to C2 tilde, which is half log 1 plus G2 square P over sigma square. And then if it is between G3 and G2, you want to ensure that the receiver gets at least C3 tilde, which is half log 1 plus G3 square P over sigma square. So, so if you're in this particular region, then you get, you're actually able to receive, uh, you're, you're able to decode something at this particular rate. If you are in this particular region, then then you get some something more, you get more information. Uh, you get C2 tilde number of bits, n times C2 tilde number of bits. And if you, and if the actual channel gain is even better, if, you, if, you're, if the fading coefficient is large enough, then, then you're able to decode the maximum amount of information. So think about this as whatever, 720p. Uh, this is 480p uh, and this is 240p and if it's below a certain amount then there's obviously nothing you can do so 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 below this you get zero right it's it's a deep fade uh, nothing else you can do so if the channel gain was known to both the transmitter and the receiver then then this is easy to to accomplish right because both the channel both the transmitter and the receiver know exactly what G is, whether it is in the green region or the uh, or the dark blue region or the light blue region, and and the transmitter can can choose one of these three rates, All right? But but in the absence of channel state information at the transmitter, the the transmitter can't really choose one of these three rates, All right? We're assuming that you have only channel state information at the receiver, correct? So in this case, what you do is that you use a broadcast uh, channel approach, right? You use superposition codes. All right, so let's assume that we're, there were only two channel coefficients, uh, G1, G2, and G3, or, or okay, may, maybe even if there are three coefficients, it's fine. Uh, let me move this. Okay, so, so the basic idea is to use a superposition code. Uh, so, so think about the following problem where uh, you have a broadcast channel, you're transmitting XN, and there are three channels, one with channel coefficient G1, the other with channel coefficient G2, and the third with channel coefficient G3. Okay, and then you have additive noise. Zn. Zn, Zn. Okay. So, so what can you so, so you know that G1 is greater than G2 and G2 is greater than G3. So, what can you say about these channels? What kind of a broadcast channel is this? Degraded. Exactly, so it's degraded, right? So the ten second channel is degraded with respect to the first channel, and the third channel is degraded with respect to the second channel, and therefore also the first channel. So this, so you're fixing G1, G2, and G3 beforehand, so therefore you're fixing this channel. So this is a degraded channel, all right? Uh, so since this is a degraded channel, what the transmitter does is that it uses a superposition code uh, such that, so it, it, it splits its message into three parts. 
okay, one R1, one at rate R1, the other at rate R2, and the third at rate R3. And, and basically, this is chosen in the following way. So R1 is, let's say that you choose R1 to be close to C3, that is the, 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 the channel, the capacity of this particular channel, of the third channel. You, sh you make sure that R1 plus R2 is approximately equal to C2 and R1 plus R2 plus R3 is approximately equal to uh, C1. So, so, so when, when I say approximately, it's something which is close to CI but slightly less than CI so that you are able to decode with vanishingly small probability of error. After all, it has to be in the achievable rate region. Right, so so suppose that it's the it, suppose that the, the true channel gain turns out to be here. So so the transmitter just uses a superposition code, and then transmits the the code word. Right, the receiver gets y n. It gets a particular y n through G, through the slow fading channel, but it also knows g. So it knows which of these three intervals g lies in if if g lies in the black interval that is if the channel gain is too small then you give up there's no point in even trying to decode but then if it is in the green uh, interval then it's as though the so it is as though the receiver is seeing this particular the output of this particular channel all right so so then you use, you decode in some sense the cloud center. All right, so you only decode the cloud center and since it's a superposition code, uh, you only decode the cloud center and then you don't bother about uh, what the satellite code words are. And, it, and you know that it, it can be done because after all, this is a broadcast channel. So this is the effective channel from the transmitter to the receiver. It is the third channel is sort of the effective uh, channel. If, if G3 is larger than this, obviously, yeah, sorry, if the actual G is greater than G3, then definitely you can decode the cloud center because you only have a better channel. And and you can and since since this is C3, you know that you're going to be able to reliably decode. So you can decode the cloud center, which is at rate R1. And R1 is chosen to be half log 1 plus G3 square P over sigma square. So, so that is fine. Now, if, if the channel, if, if the actual channel gain lies in the blue interval, so it's better than this, then you can do something better. All right. So, so therefore, the effective channel is, is this, is this particular case. All right. And then since it's a, it's a degraded broadcast channel, and this is degraded with respect to this, uh, you can decode the cloud center. And a satellite code word. Recall that in the two user broadcast channel, the, the stronger user was able to decode both messages, right? B both the message intended for himself, as well as the the message intended for the other user because he saw a stronger user uh, and because he saw because he saw a stronger channel right so so therefore in this case you are able to decode at this particular rate so r1 plus r2 which is half log 1 plus g2 square p over sigma square so you get more information right and and similarly if if the channel is even better then you can decode all of the information, all right? So you can decode a total amount of information, which is n times uh, half log one plus g one square p over sigma square. Okay. So so the magic of superposition codes is that you can do this even though the transmitter did not know what the actual channel gain was, all right? Uh, only the receiver knows what channel gain is, what the actual channel gain is. 
but the transmitter is doing this obliviously of the channel gain it's only using the superposition code so therefore if the channel is better then the then the receiver can can decode more information if the channel is worse then it only decodes a part of the information all right uh, and and that is that that's one way of getting uh, this sort of multi resolution data so but 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 this doesn't always hold for all kinds of applications uh, right because uh, because for example if if you are actually transmitting say text messages then then there's no point in receiving a part of the text message you either want it completely or you want or you get nothing at all but but in uh, but when you're trying to get say audio or video data where it's okay to have a sort of lossy representation of of the actual transmitted data then this approach can be used uh, all right any any questions Sir, uh, like, I mean, I just want to mean like, uh, mean, like mm -hmm. just give a kind of analogy, like what we can take as an another example is mm -hmm. like a, a DTH application, like a DTH setup box. Okay. Whenever uh, like SD, I mean, like whenever any weather interference is there, like the signal will not be applicable for a HD channel, whereas the same signal will be available with the SD. Exactly. So uh, same kind of uh, analogy can we can we apply for that also? Exactly, it's the same thing. So. so that is what is done in practice although in in many cases both the transmitter and the receiver i mean in in certain applications uh, both the transmitter and the receiver may know what the channel gains are and and in that case it becomes easier but but it is the same principle uh so so it's so if if you have if you see if the channel gain is low then you only transmit sd if Uh, the channel gain is high then then you only transmit hd but in those cases sir like uh, for hd like uh, like whenever there is any uh, signal which is being received then uh -huh. that means uh, like we do have uh, or else like we are fixing on this particular gain right sir uh i'm not sure i understand what you said so so the channel gain is going to re it's it's a random quantity but it's going to remain constant for the the entire duration all right so at the time of transmitting you don't know what the channel gain is but the receiver gets to know what the channel gain is because he's estimating it in some way uh right right yes so So, if the channel gain is large enough, then the decoder is going to decode HD information. If the channel gain is not too large, but it has to be above a certain quantity, then you can decode at SD. If it's below the smallest threshold, then then you give up. There's no there's no point at all. Right. So, so yeah. So, so one way, uh, uh, as in the DTH application you mentioned. if it's cloudy then then the receiver tries to uh, decode sd if it's perfectly clear you try to decode at hd uh, but on the other hand if it's raining very heavily then uh, then yeah, you get nothing at all okay and that is something that you see directly in say youtube right uh you see that youtube is automatically changing the quality of videos uh as depending on what the channel coefficient is okay so can we yes. apply the same logic even to the videos which we in generally in generally for any kind of prime video or any other thing yeah, like yeah. there will be various download videos video categories like depending upon like how much data that you have to uh, how much data it has to actually burn or like with this particular hour so so you can fix so so even for example on youtube or or prime video or, or any anything for that matter a, any uh, video streaming or a uh, video conferencing application there are settings you can choose and and some one of the settings is typically auto 
So depending on how good a channel you have, it automatically sets the the quality of the video, right? And in the, and in that case, it does this adaptively. But but then if you say you 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 force it to be at uh, let's say at a certain resolution, 720p or 480p, then then you notice that uh, if if the if the channel becomes poor, then then it starts buffering. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, sir? Yes. Uh, sorry. So this is regarding the first uh, topic actually regarding that uh, slow fading and fast fading. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, so in that we have seen that uh, like uh, given if the G is very low, then okay. it might happen that uh, there will be an event of uh, outage or deep fade. That's why we are saying that uh, slow fading is uh, sometimes uh, not better than the fast fading. Correct. But uh, like my doubt is uh, like, is it uh, for the case uh, only for few cases or if we average it over around, let us uh, assume around 1000 or uh, around 10,000 durations and we uh, see the performance of the slow fading and fast fading then mm -hmm. also like uh, the fast fading will perform better than slow fading or is it just for a particular uh, instant uh, like uh, are we saying so so i mean i mean in practice so so here we are, we are essentially looking at two extremes right yes, uh, so one extreme is that uh, the channel gain varies in every channel use and the other extreme is what, what we call fear slow fading is where the channel gain remains constant for the entire duration. But, but in practice, uh, what we actually have is that it's somewhere in between. All right. It's, uh, so, so the coherence interval is, is something which is comparable to the, the entire block length. And, and so, so, so that, regime in between really what what determines whether one channel one kind of channel is is better than the other kind of channel and uh, so error correcting codes fail this this idea of error correction fails if if you are in a deep fade and and the channel is is a slow fading channel right so in that sense it is worse but uh, in a fast fading channel, on average, you're going to have a better channel because, because you know that at least with, with if, if you look at a large enough block length where the channel is rapidly changing, then you know that for at least for a good fraction of the time, you're going to see a good channel. Whereas for some fraction of the time, you're going to see a bad channel. But on the other hand, for a slow fading channel, either it's, it's, it's very good or very bad. If it's bad, it's bad throughout. If it's good, it is good throughout. All right, and and we'll see how uh, it becomes a little easier. So so it becomes extremely challenging if if the channel gain is not known to the transmitter or the receiver. Uh, but then, if the channel gain is known, if it's a slow fading channel and the channel gain is known to both the encoder and the decoder. Then it turns out that you can do something better. Uh, in some sense, you can do the same, at least as good as a fast uh, as a fast fading channel in a slow fading channel. Uh, okay. Yes, sir. Uh, right. So, so in some sense, a slow fading channel is is worse than a fast fading channel, and this is particularly if you have no channel state information at the transmitter. You have only channel state information at the receiver because you will be in outage. You are not, the probability of error is, 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 is always going to be bounded away from zero. But, uh, but if you have channel state information at the transmitter, as we'll see next, it is, you can do something much better. You can, you can sort of mitigate this, this effect. Okay. Yes, yes, I get it. Right. So, so that's what we come to next, and that is 
suppose you have the channel gain is known both to the transmitter and the receiver then then essentially you don't fix a particular rate the problem with a slow fading channel is that if you fix a particular rate then then you know that the channel gain is going to go below the capacity and therefore the probability of error will will not decay to zero it will tend to one right but if you know the actual channel gain at the transmitter then then you can do something better so even in this case you you don't have an ergodic capacity but then you can you can achieve an average rate right so so what what the transmitter can do is that since it knows g since it knows the exact realization of g it it always transmits at a rate you you know what the, what g is beforehand so you only send a certain number of bits uh which satisfies r less than half log 1 plus g square p over sigma square right so maybe yeah so you always trans you, you can always transmit at this rate but now the rate is not constant it depends on the realization of g so so you don't fix the rate beforehand depending on what the actual channel coefficient is you only transmit those many number of bits right so in this case there is no ergodic capacity or, or, or it's not the standard notion of capacity but you change the rate adaptively depending on g right and in this case uh you can achieve a capacity of expectation over g half log 1 plus g square p over sigma square all right which i mean if you if you look at this stare at this expression then you'll see that you've seen this in the last class right in the last class we saw that if you have csir at the receiver then then the capacity is equal to expectation over g of half log 1 plus g square p over sigma z square right and and effectively what we have is the same thing right it is just if if it's a slow fading channel and and g is uh, is known to both the transmitter and the receiver then the average rate is the same as the ergodic capacity but this is not the ergodic capacity that is something to keep in mind because you are not fixing the rate beforehand the rate is adaptively changed with the channel gain all right and and in some sense this 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 is easier than the previous scenario because in this case you can use a standard awg and code book whereas for the fast fading case you will need to design a separate code book because it's a different kind of a memoryless channel and and a standard awg and code book and a standard awg and encoder and decoder doesn't work so so in most cases so that is why in wireless communications we we tend to think that uh, a slow fading channel is easier because the inherent assumption is that the channel gain is known both to the transmitter and the receiver and and that is why you can operate at this particular rate and and the techniques used are the same as what you would do for standard awg and channels all right uh, any questions sir uh, like yes. uh, what could be the comment on power constraint with respect to this uh, slow fading channel so it's the same right the power constraint is fixed no matter what kind of a channel it is but uh, in generally sir like whenever we see any kind of mobile communications mm -hmm. like uh, uh, whenever there is no i mean like if 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 channels are busy or if channel is not available or okay. like uh, whenever whenever 
uh, like when are the signal signal strength is also low then okay. uh, the power the power consumption in terms of uh, it's a radi- i mean like in terms of generation might be it might be fixed like generating the pilot signal to get this uh, channel mm-hmm. but whereas uh, when are when like for a particular amount of for, for a certain time if it is not able to get that particular channel mm-hmm. then uh, like the, the the power will be mean like it will be increasing its power and then it will be uh, i mean trying to Correct. get it from uh, from surrounding cells right true true so so i mean two two comments here so one comment is that of course so, so as we'll see uh, as the, as as if you, if you know g then you can in fact do better by adaptively changing the power used uh, right so so we did that for the fast fading channel as well uh, we basically we used a water filling approach yes so we used a water filling approach where you where you didn't keep the power transmitted a constant depending on what the channel gain is you can vary the power uh, but 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 one thing over here is that uh, so, so so all our, our only interest here we're not we're not analyzing every single aspect of the communication system uh, because of course right now we're saying that uh, our only interest is to know what is the best that we can do what throughput is achievable okay and you're saying that if if a certain throughput is not achievable then you just give up and and you don't bother about many other issues that that come up in practical wireless communication systems uh, i mean we don't account for many things right now we're just simplifying a lot of things because uh, in a practical wireless communication system you also have to take into account things like uh uh fairness so you want to ensure that one user is not hogging all of the resources uh you 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 set a certain threshold saying that if even though a particular user has has a poor channel or or does not have enough resources he somehow is allocated a certain amount of resource and and that is what and and you also want to ensure that every user gets a certain quality of service or or a, or a certain throughput guarantee so so which means that uh, even if the channel gain is low then then maybe you pump in more information you say that i'm going to use more power but i want to get a certain amount of information across All right so so you should be able to at least be able to say transmit smss or receive smss uh, all right in which case you'll be consuming a lot of power but uh but but so 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 these are sort of changed adaptively depending on the actual scenario at hand but but on average if once you fix a power constraint it's it, it typically remains a constant but uh but but there are a lot of uh these minor low level optimizations that are done uh which 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 also have to take care of edge cases which have to take care of things like fairness quality of service requirements and so on uh but but those are yeah different aspects does that answer your question yes sir yes sir all right uh, any other questions okay so if not uh, let's stop for now so uh, we'll continue in, in the next class tomorrow